the first book of Kings and the chapter 12. We're back again uh, this morning at the man called Jeroboam. Now, we're not going to get this portion of Scripture finished this morning as I thought we would last week. We'll be returning again to it, not next Lord's Day, but the morning after, God willing, if we're still here. But we're at 1 Kings chapter 12 again, and we're reading from the verse 25, the verse 25. Take your time as we read the Word of God together and keep your Bible open. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, and this is where the problem was, he said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, and that this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again unto, the, unto their Lord and even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go against Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, Is this too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now notice who he say and brought them out. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this became a sin, for the people went to worship before one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Now, I want you to take very careful scrutiny as we read these next two verses, because there's a repetition. And when God repeats something in verse after verse, we need to take heed to it. And what is going on here? Verse 32. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month. Now let me pause a wee moment. This was the feast of the Jewish tabernacle. But it was on the seventh month, according to Leviticus 23. But he changed it to the eighth month. Now we see the hand of the devil here, for the devil's good at twisting and tinkering and altering the word of God. Once you do that, you're bound for trouble and you're bound for judgment. Let's read it again. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel sacrifice unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he made. So he offered up the altar. Now here we have it again. He offered up the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month. Even in his, in the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. You see, it wasn't from the word of God. And he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. You notice there it says, like unto the feast. 
like onto the feast. It wasn't the feast, it was an imitation, a replication of the feast of tabernacle. Let's read the last verse again. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now I don't believe there should be a chapter hidden here. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar of the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus said the Lord, behold, a child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Judgment has come because of what was going on in this place. The judgment of God is falling upon this terrible sin that this man, that terrible sin that this man is doing. And I want you to notice just as a matter of interest that he, the prophet, man sent from God with the word of God to the house of God, he came and he mentioned and told them that Josiah by name, a child shall be born. It was 365 years after this until Josiah came and brought in the mighty revival that brought down all the idols, idolatry that was in the land. Jo Josiah is one of the few people in Scripture who was named before he was born, but it just shows you the accuracy of the prophecy of the word of the living God. That did come to pass without any doubt. Verse 3 and he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, Jeroboam's hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And so reads his word to us this morning. Father, we just ask now, as we come to unravel some of these verses, as we come, Lord, to preach thy word this morning, we're conscious, Lord, that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We say, Lord, above everything else this morning, that thou would increase and that I would decrease and that your name will be glorified and your word, Lord, will go forth and will be received as it comes from the Lord himself. Thank you for these scriptures, Lord. Thank you for the prophetical word of God, the word of God that standeth sure and never changes. Lord, we just ask this morning that you'll help us to appreciate that we are in the presence of God. Amen. Proud, apostate, domineering leaders don't like to lose their power and their grip and their hold over their people. Jeroboam, for fear of the ten tribes of Israel under his command, would go back, would go back to the true worship of Jehovah in the temple at Jerusalem. He skillfully devised an alternative deception of deceptive plan of worship. And this plan of worship, we read, was with these false idolic calves. And uh, we could say that he was mixing the world with the church, and we'll see that in a wee moment, and we saw it last week. Of course, that's all around us today. 
and denominations and groups and fellowships across our land. There's a mixture. And the doctrine of the separation from the world has fallen onto hard ground in the church. There's nothing new about this. Always remember that the devil's ploy is to dilute the pure word of the living God and then render it useless. This happened under the Roman Emperor Constantine after the birth of the church. How state and church was mixed together, paralyzing the power, diluting the gospel, and doing irreparable damage that goes on to this day in the church of Jesus Christ. What Jeroboam did here was he built two altars, uh, golden calves, one at Dan in the north and one at Bethel in the south. And we read this morning and last week that he gathered round him preachers and priests who William Shakespeare would describe as the lesser breed, the lowest of society, men who had no gift, men who had no calling from God or no mandate. And they went out deceiving the people. In verse 28, it said, These are the gods, O Israel, who delivered you from the bondage, from the tyranny, from the land of Egypt. They said to them, It was them, these gods, these false idols from Egypt that brought thee out and gave thee the quails and the manna and healed you when the serpent bit you. And what they're saying is, what's going out as invitations from this false worship is come to us. Come to our new dimension, our accommodating, our friendly church, our new age church. It's time for you to break free from Rehoboam and the two tribes that are worshiping in Jerusalem. That is antiquitous. It's legalistic. It's the law of Moses and Solomon and David. And we're past those days now. We don't want those days now. There's no need for you fathers and mothers to trail your children three times a year to the important feast of Jehovah way up to Jerusalem. It's not fair for you to have to carry and bring your sacrifices up there three times a year. No, we'll make something more accommodating for you. We have something much more pleasing to you. Now, old Jeroboam, knowing that at any rate, the older people wouldn't buy into this, so he devised not only a golden calf on one side, but the replica of the precious cherubim from the ark on the other side. And we haven't time to go into the cherubim and the mercy seat and the protection and mercy that it showed to the people. But one side was Egypt and one side was Israel. One side was God and one side was the devil. And thousands of them swallowed it. And they trampled underfoot the first great commandment. I am the Lord, the God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. False worship, which eventually took them back to the Bab took them into the Babylonish bondage. And 50 years on from this, when Elijah came, the whole nation was under idolatry. One apostate minister, let me tell you, can damn thousands of souls. One false church and false preachers can damn thousands of people if they go away from the truth of God's word. 
Now, as we continue this morning with this second message on Jeroboam, we do well to remember what I said last week of what the old Francis Schaeffer said before he died. And here's what he said. He said, there's a, there's a day coming when there'll be a church to suit the whims and the views of every carnal Christian. And I think we are at that day. As you look across the land and the nation and the groups and the people and the churches that have split and formed all over the place. All over the place you see it. I want to draw your attention this morning to a fuller parallel between the old time fundamental truths that Moses, Joshua, and David and Solomon all preached. And those old fundamental truths that were loved by our forefathers down through the years. Men and preachers who stood for the doctrine that loved the Word of God. Men, let me tell you, who healed in the Reformation. And men of God who healed in some of the greatest revivals in the 16th, 17th, and the 18th century. Revivals that delivered our nation in years and times gone past. Revivals that came with mighty power and swept across the abyss of debauchery and the departure from the faith that there was. And I want to say this morning again, and that's why we're emphasizing revival in our prayer meetings, Unless we have an intervention from heaven, unless we have a Holy Ghost move of the Spirit of God from heaven, we're in great trouble. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why our nation and our province is in the grip of a sexual fever. Now, I've chosen these words very carefully this morning. Our nation and our province is in the grip of a sexual fever. This damnable woke ideology, fueled by the worst left-wing Marxist communist government ever we had in Westminster, we are on the verge of seeing some awful things. And I want to say this morning, and I have studied a bit of history, Whenever God turns his back and hides his face from a nation and from a people, the first thing that you see, and I can prove that to you this morning, is a nominous rise of sexual perversion. We're living in the days when every day we hear of pedophiles, transgenders, sodomites, the days of Noah and the days of Lot, are the days in which we live. There's not a day that you'll turn on your phone or watch your news or lift your paper, but you're bombarded with filthy, explicit, pornographic filth. There's hardly a day will go past, but you'll hear, even in our own land, of the rape of men, the rape of women, and worst of all, the rape of children. Indecent images of two and three year old are found on the phones. And God only knows, we only know the wee bit that comes out in the open. And my friend, if we could see what was going on behind the scenes this morning, I tell you, there wouldn't be one of us but would be weeping and crying to God in these prayer meetings. Ministers, pastors, doctors, lawyers, Politicians, journalists, teachers, and, uh, and through the courts have come, even this year, in Northern Ireland, cases of buggery, incest, and bestial bestiality. They've all been before the courts in Northern Ireland. I tell you, perilous times have come. We're in a sexual sick society. 
I was just hearing the other day or reading the other day where a six-year-old boy had a sex change operation in Australia. Six-year-old boy. What sort of parents has this lad? What sort of doctors would do something like this? And that begs me to ask, what sort of a society would have this? I tell you what sort of a society. A perverted, demonic society. I read during the week that the Northern Ireland Library Board have recommended that drag queens and witches be brought into the schools and subsidized by the government. You heard during the week that it's gone that the ex-soldier in Bournemouth who was fined £9,000 for praying, not out loud, for praying to himself at a, an abortion zone. A nation that from 1967 has butchered 8 million children. And you're not allowed, that's not praying openly, that's praying to himself. Where are we heading to? It's not going to be very long until we're banned from preaching the gospel, not only in the streets, but in our churches. The days of gospel tracts and tents and trailers are coming to an end. They're at a premium. Why am I telling you all this? What is this to do with Jeroboam and these calves? I say to you this morning, it has everything to do with them. Everything. There's nowhere in the gospel, there's nowhere in the word of God that God has anything to do with this hybrid, mixed, false church of the new age that we're seeing masquerading as the church of Jesus Christ today. There's nowhere in the Word of God. These people have no answer to the state of the nation. Churches like this have no power. That's what Paul tells us. They deny the power thereof, and if they have no power, they can do nothing. And if we have no demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost, things are going to go worse. They have no power. They're not able to hold back the wrath. What's going on out there today? No, they're contributing to it. They're not only a mixture, God and the devil. They're blinded and they're deceived. After all God had done for these people. After all the blessings that he gave them after his providing for them from the manna and the quails and lifting the Red Sea for them and keep keeping them and protecting them and blessing them, after them all, the saying, he didn't bring us out at all. But these calves did. It was a mixed society. It are these golden calves of Egypt that have protected you and provided you and blessed for you and all fell for it. But there's not only the mixture, there's the mockery. They had a harvest thanksgiving service, and before you say anything, I'm not against harvest thanksgiving service. They had a harvest thanksgiving service. The feast of the tabernacles, also called the feast of the ingathering. The last of the great feasts of the seven great feasts of Jehovah, the last of them, which you see as we close. The feast of the ingathering where the people of God, the Jews, and I think it may be the sin month of October, it might have been last week, where they gather in the barley and the corn and the, and the cucumbers and the melons and they praise God for his provision for them every year. God called them to remember and that's what the tabernacle feast was about, to remember what God has done for you people in years and generations gone by. God expects us to remember. And let me tell you this, he expects us to remember his son. God expects us to remember. And he wants them to remember that he brought them out, that he blessed them, that he gave them the manna, he gives them the quails. And that they were living in booze. The tabernacle means booze. 
where in the tabernacle feast that is past, I'm pure, in the tabernacle feast of the Bilboos in Jerusalem, places of shelter where they lived for seven days during the feast, and those seven days they were living in it to say, God, to remember that I tabernacled with you in the wilderness. Remember that I blessed you in the wilderness. Remember that I protected you in the wilderness. And they're looking away back to the days when the blessings of God was upon them. That's what it's about. Never forget, he says, the pit from whence you've been dug. Remember. Remember what I have done for you. Remember all the blessings of God that came upon you. And they made these uh, tabernacles, these booths of sycamore branches, willow branches, and palm branches. And seven days, I say, they lived on the streets. And they were saying to God, God has blessed us. God protected us. There was the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God wanted them to remember. He wanted to remember that they found grace in the wilderness. And they did. But this boy here is mocking it. That's what he's doing. He's mocking it. And it's no wonder that God confronted him. And God blasted this whole business out of action. You see, there's not only the provision and the protection here, there's a prophecy here in the tabernacle feast. And I couldn't get away from this to go on any further with my message when I began to think of this. There's a, prophet, there's a prophetic fulfillment of Scripture in this tabernacle feast, in these booths where they stayed for seven days in the shelter of Jerusalem for the tabernacles. It tells us that time is passing and fleeting. It tells us that deathbeds are coming. It tells us that, uh, that life will soon end. We're only passing through. We hear we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're marching on towards Zion. And God wanted to remind them, listen, you, listen, your life is very scarce. Your days are numbered. We haven't very long, I tell you. Alex Salmon knew that. He was opening a bottle of ketchup and before he had it poured out, he was dead. My brother Eddie was opening a letter and before he had it open, he was dead. I heard of a man recently who was taking the top of an egg and before he had it opened, he was dead. My friend, we're fleeting. We're passing through. It'll soon be all over. And that man, drug man, drug as he was or whatever, throwing himself outside the window in Buenos Aires, my friend, listen, it's fleeting. It's passing. Death and judgment draweth nigh. A new direction. I don't know what direction that man went in. Uh, what direction are you going in this morning? If this was to be your last day, if you were to open something today for the last time, and as you're opening it, you go out into eternity, where will you be? Come on now. Because life, here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You see, there's a provision that was being celebrated here and mocked. There was a protection that was being celebrated here and mocked. There was a prophecy. But you know, the above thing all about the Feast of the Tabernacles, it was the last and great feast of the seven feasts that you'll see as we close. Le Le Leviticus 23 and 40 says, Ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God. This is where they sang the Hallelujah Psalms. This is where they praised the Lord and thanked the Lord for all his blessings during the year and the years that have gone. Thanking God for his goodness, his long suffering. This is the, it, it, it all ended in a crescendo of praise. These men are mocking it. Jeroboam's mocking it. He's doing the same as, 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 as Aaron in Exodus 32 with the golden calf, dancing, reveling, and carousing round this idol. And my friend, it's coming to an end. And our nation is languishing under idolatry this morning and is coming to an end unless we have a move of God. Unless the Holy Spirit pours out His, His mighty power upon us, my friend. 
the church that we have out there this morning will not do it. It'll not do it. It'll not do it. You can't expect God to move when the devil's in it. We need, we need separation from the world. We need to be clean. We need to be holy. We need to be fierce for God in these last days or it's all over. Oh, if I could waken up the people of God to scriptures like this. How fierce these days are we live in. Let me give you this. The feast of the trumpets and the feast of the atonement and the feast of the tabernacles were three feasts that followed one another. The feast of the trumpets was the trumpet sounding for the returning of the people to Jerusalem. Isaiah 27 and, thir- 27 and 13 says, Those that are ready to perish shall come from Assyria and worship in Jerusalem. It was the feast of the returning. Those that were ready to perish returned. Who's ready to perish here this morning? Those that are ready to perish. Who will be the next to perish from this congregation? Backslider, it's time to return. The trumpet sounding this morning for you to come back. Come back to the prayer meetings. Come back to the table. Come back before it's too late. And then the feast of the atonement wasn't for returning. It was for redemption where the lamb was slain in Yom Kippur, the blood of the lamb. And the feast of the tabernacles was for rejoicing. Now I want you, and we have five, ten minutes left, to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 7. And verse 1. Here we have the Lord Jesus at the last great feast, the feast of the ingathering, the feast of the tabernacles. Is it any wonder that Jeroboam mocked it? Because the devil mocks anything that God loves. You watch this now here in verse 1. After these things walked in Galilee, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. He wouldn't go up to you. Not because he was afraid of them killing him, but this is what was happening. Verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacle was at hand. This is the feast they're celebrating here in Jerusalem now as we read this scripture. But his brethren said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Let me stop a wee moment there. These are his brethren in the flesh. These are his brothers that lived with him, that were brought up with him, and he had a number of them, and he had sisters. And what they're saying to him, you go up to Jerusalem and do the mighty things that you're doing around here, and people will worship you. Well, that's what the devil does. That's what the devil tried. Throw yourself down from the top of the temple, and the people will say, you're mighty. So they're telling the Lord what to do. Listen, Don't you tell the Lord what to do. And don't you tell the Lord where to go. Because John put in in verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Your family's not always right, you know. 
You need to test these things out with the Word of God. This is the devil's work. Verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is already, has already come. The world cannot hate you. How would it hate them when they were in it and part of it? But me it hateth, because I testify of it, and the works thereof are evil. I tell you, the modern church, the uh, facilitating church, the church that's no different from the world, my friend, you have it here very, very, very carefully and very easy. They don't know anything about the presence and the power of God. For he says, I'm going up. And when he had said these words, he abode still in Galilee. Verse 10, but when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. And if we read this scripture carefully, he went up in the middle of the week about the third day of the feast. Can I say a wee word here? The bounty was on the Lord's head. And then he was seeking to kill him, and he knew it. And yet God had commanded that this feast should be kept. It was a command. There weren't, all the feasts weren't command, but this one was a command. And whether they were going to kill him or whether the death penalty was upon his head, which he knew very well, he was going to obey God. And we ought to obey God rather than men. Didn't come into the equation that he would run and hide. But he went in his own time. And God does things in his own time and in his own way. And he went up. He went up in his own time to there. Verse 14 says, Now now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. He not only went up, he went into the temple and he preached the word. Then verse 37 we come to a close with. And I want you to get your eyes on verse 37. That's why I couldn't go on any further when I got to these feasts. I was so hurt and so grieved and was so to see the imitation feast of the devil. The replica of the true living word of God tinkered and tampered with and thousands gathered round it. My dear friend, remember this, that we're in a battle and the battle is fierce. And the battle for you young people will be fierce. It'll be fierce. Go back. Go out of a house like the lifeboat where they're preaching legalism all the time. Go out of it. Go away to where you can sing and where you can praise. Well, here, there's nobody praised more than these people. Go away to somewhere where you can dress what you like and do what you like and live what you like. And there's no difference. It'll be very hard to know. It's very hard to know this morning whether it's a church or whether it's a a disco. Oh, boys, you're fierce this morning. I'm only seeing what I'm seeing. I'm only seeing what I'm looking around me. I'm only seeing after a man of 78 years of age, a man 40 40 years more in the work of God, I'm only seeing what I'm seeing. And we're still in the state that we're in. And because God has turned away from us, the sexual sins are everywhere. God knows what you'd hear next and who it'd come from. I don't know what's going on in this congregation. I don't know what's going on in your home. But God knows. He knows. And on this last great day, and that's what it says, In verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood. Remember now, he stood. Remember they're looking to kill him. He stood and he cried. He cried. 
There was an an intensity here. But there was also a simplicity here because he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. How simple is that word come? How simple. He says, of any man, and there were, no, there were more than Jews gathered around here, you know, the, the people had come to watch on, and there were other people. He says, of any man, any woman, of any man, any woman, thirst, tell me, are you thirsty this morning? Well, what are you thirsty for? Are you thirsty this morning? What's going on in your life this morning? He says, if any man thirst, are you thirsting for pleasure this morning? Wherever you're listening to me out there this morning, tell me, are you thirsting for pleasure? Well, I'll tell you this, at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I tell you this this morning, that I have pleasure, I have pleasure every day of my life. It's not in the pub and the drugs and the drink. You see where that's ending. Are you thirsty for pleasure? Tell me, are you thirsty for riches? My God is rich in mercy. He's rich in grace. He's rich in goodness. He's rich in love. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. (laughs) I tell you, I'm rich this morning. I'm rich. Are you thirsting for pleasure? Are you, are, are, are you thirsting for peace? My peace. My peace. I give unto you not as the world giveth. This world can't give something that it hasn't got. There's no peace, says Jehovah to the wicked. But he says, My peace, peace, perfect peace. In this world of sin, Bickerstaff pen, but the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. I'm at peace this morning. Peace like a river attendeth my way. Are you, are you thirsty for pleasure? Are you thirsty for riches? Are you thirsty for peace? Are you thirsty for power? Do you want Holy Ghost power? Do you want Holy Ghost power to live the Christian life? Do you want Holy Ghost power to pray? Do you want Holy Ghost power to preach? Do you want Holy Ghost power when you go out onto the street? Do you want Holy Ghost power? Well, listen to what Jesus says. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's what he says. Let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth in me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive. Power comes from the Holy Ghost. Dunamis, the power of God. Do you want power to sing, power to preach, power to witness? Well, you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Are you striving for something more in your life? The house doesn't satisfy you. The marriage doesn't satisfy you. The home doesn't satisfy you. Nothing satisfies you anymore. You've got the money. You've got the car. You've got the holiday. You've got everything. But are you, are, you, are you thirsty for the living God this morning? These people were rejoicing and praising God on the last day of the feast. Let me close by saying this. The priests went down to the pool of Siloam on this last day, the last hour of the feast. They went down with their golden vessels down to the pool of Siloam, a trail of them, and they brought up water. And they all came in before the Lord. And this is what he's watching. According to Leviticus, they poured the water out on the altar. The water poured one after the other out of their golden, out into the altar. This is what Jeroboam's mocking, out into the altar. 
What does water speak of? It speaks of the word yes. It speaks of the Holy Spirit yet. But what did it mean to them? It meant, it meant that for 40 years in the wilderness, they never thirsted. The water came from the rock to feed a million and a half or more of them every day. And they're also celebrating the fact that when the, when the harvest was coming and the famines come, he sent the early rain and he sent the latter rain. Bless his name. Bless his lovely name. My friend, he gives us drink after drink after drink every day. He supplies our need every day. And they're thanking God for the times of the famine and in the wilderness when it was dry and when it was barren and he sent the rain and he sent the water and they're praising and they're rejoicing and they're singing the hallelujah psalms and they're ecstatic, I tell you, with remembering what God has done and we're so dry this morning. They're heading towards Zion. That was the Feast of the Tabernacles was about. It's only temporary. Remember it every year. Remember how good God has been. Remember how he protected you. Remember how he preserved you in the wilderness, in the waste, howling wilderness. Oh, what a name. And he's provided you with water. It's only temporary. We're moving on to Canaan. We're moving on to the land of Canaan. And that's where we are this morning. We're marching to Zion. Old Dick Shaw used to say, when we're marching, we're not fighting. The march, the fighting's over. The battle's over. The victory's won. We're moving on. We're moving out. We're moving up into his presence some of these days. I tell you this, I'm not going into heaven on a zimmer. Or a stick. I'm not going in limping or hopping. I'm going marching. I'm marching to Zion. I'm going to have an abundant entrance into his presence. With the boy in from Anna, if I just get in, I thought he was talking about a buyer door. He says, if I just get in and get the door closed behind me, I'll be happy. Well, I'll not be. I want an abundant entrance into his presence. I praise you when we move in, move out of this old body, all the pains and all the sickness and all the cancers and all the troubles and all the lumbago and all the arthritis and all the Alzheimer's and everything else will be gone. Hallelujah. We'll be praising the Lord for all the way he led us and all the things that he has done for us. And I want to be part of a church that believes God. I want to be part of an assembly of God's people who loves this old book and who wants to pray and go on and go through. I want to be a part of an assembly of God that's going to provide get to a school for the children and keep them from the drag queens and the lies and the things that are going to come down the line. Oh, but our principles are lovely, we Christian. Very good, and thank God for Christian principles in the schools. And thank God for Christian teachers, and you need to pray for them in the schools. But their authority is very limited. Their authorities are very limited. And it will be worse limited when this boy gets all these things passed that they're doing. I want to be part of a church that loves children. I want to be a part of a church that gets the word of God out to the children. I want to be a part of a church who loves the Savior and wants revival. The move of God, the Holy Spirit. No, I'm going into heaven like the boy in Acts 3, jumping. I can't jump very high at the minute, but I'm going into heaven jumping and leaping and praising the Lord. Hallelujah. We're marching to die. Mon will sing it, 706. Come ye that love the Lord. It's for you now that love the Lord, this hymn. And if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll go up to the feast, whether 
It means death or not. 706, come ye that love the Lord and let your joys be known. Join in a song of sweet accord and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Hallelujah. Sing it with all your heart. our harvest thanks to me all that he has done for us in the past let us praise him in these in verse 2 Thank you and we praise you from the depth of our heart this morning for all your mercies, all your goodness, all your blessings. Father, help us to stand strong and firm in these last days. We take authority over the powers of hell. We take authority over every demon, every lion, every filthy, every accusing spirit 
that comes from the pit of hell. We bind them in the name of Jesus. We pray for liberty and freedom in the spirit for these dear people this morning. We praise you, Lord, for what you've done. If any man thirst, oh God, let him come. Praise you. We want to come to thee this morning. We come to drink the wells deep this morning. We hallelujah. Praise you that the woman came, Lord, with all her sin and all her problems and all the things that were done. She got a drink and she never thirsted again. Lord, we thank you that many of us have got a drink and we have never thirsted again. Oh God, we praise you this morning for your love. Praise you for the cross. Praise you, Lord, for what it means to us. Praise you, Lord, for the atonement. Praise you, Lord, for the death of Christ on Calvary's cross. We thank thee, we bless thee. We pray, Lord, for those that must go and bless those who stay. And may the peace and the presence of the Lord be around us and upon us even this day. For we ask it all in the lovely, precious, wonderful and adorable name of our Saviour. And for his sake, amen. Amen.